So the notes this time would be a bit um, a bit sparse than usual. So let's start. So hopefully you can see the screen, okay? So I'll be dealing with 11.1 .1 to 11.3. I'll do 11.4 and five next week. So the from what I could gather from this uh, chapter, there are three objectives. One is the first section is really to document a numerical instability when solving diffusion equations, which is really a, a fancy way of saying a, par a partial, a particular type of partial differential equation. And then you're trying to apply what you learn from chapter six directly. So what's going to happen in that kind of situation? And they document a sort of a numerical instability within the context of a of an example from finance. Uh, that's the first part. Uh, the second part is to work out a possible solution to this instability. Okay, and the solution is actually not very difficult, but surprising. And then the third uh, part is really about a missing component of the solution that uh, that is worked out in the second part. Okay, and it's really all about the notion of absolute stability. Okay, so those are the three things um, going for for us in the, th the first three sections of chapter eleven. Okay, so just um, just one thing about uh, section eleven point one is that I think it's best to read it from the middle rather than from the beginning. Uh, so you have to understand that the context of the Black-Scholes equation, which is something that is used in finance. And although I, I did dabble a bit in finance, I never, it's not this type of finance. So, so I, I don't know much about it, never used it. Can, could talk about it, but that's about it. Yeah. Um, so it's best to think of, it's best to think of that example as just a running example to motivate why we would want to study a diffusion equation. Now, the that's the focus of the chapter, and most of the most of the work is really about this uh, diffusion equation. And there are many names for diffusion equations referred to in the book. The, sometimes you see it as diffusive processes. Sometimes you see it as parabolic PDEs or parabolic partial differential equations or evolutionary PDEs. To be honest, I really don't know whether these are the right terms. Okay. But the ultimate objective is to solve a type of partial differential equation called the diffusion equation. And one specific type of diffusion equation is this heat equation that looks like this that you see in the screen. So the subscript here refers to the derivative, the partial derivative with respect to that particular variable in the subscript. So when you see u sub t, what that means is the partial derivative of u with respect to t. And when you see u sub xx, that means it's a second order partial derivative with respect to x, then x again. Okay. And the task is to solve uh, this equation. And the meaning of that is we're trying to look for a function of both x and t so that you could satisfy uh, the equation that you see on the screen. Okay, So that's essentially the, the objective. And the Black-Scholes equation could be rewritten as a form of a heat equation. That's why that's the motivating example. Okay. The K is a diffusion, what is called a constant diffusion coefficient. But in the exposition in the book, the K is usually set to one. Okay, So we're going to be looking at that version where K is equal to one. And Black-Scholes is really just a motivating example. Okay, So the solution, or at least a, a solution to this uh, heat equation involves a function of two variables, which in the book they refer to X as the space dimension, and then T is the time dimension. Okay. So the solution would involve a function of two variables, and it's very natural to apply what you learn from chapter six. So from chapter six is really about ordinary differential equation, and the idea is really just to discretize. Okay, that's the that's the main main technique, okay, with some fancy footwork to deal with instability. Uh, so apply chapter six, discretize this time over space and time. That's the natural thing to do, and. Um, and let me just show you what it kind of looks like broadly. 
Okay. So this is the Black Scholes equation that is available. Okay. Again, it's not very important how you get to this point, but rather that this uh, this could be rewritten as a heat equation, but the, the book doesn't tell you how to do that. But if we believe that, then it's this is the case. Um, so if you notice, you have this discretization over space and time in equation 11.1.8. So you divide space into these number of nodes I, from I equals zero to M, and then the time part from J equals zero to N, okay? And this time, it, this is gonna be very uncomfortable, especially if you're coming from chapter six, is because they're recycling the letters, but the letters this time mean something different. So this is something to pay attention to, okay? So H is sort of like the interval length uh, for the discretization in the space uh, dimension. And then tau is the um, uh, the length of the interval when you discretize in the, in the time dimension or some people, or in the book, they would call it a time step, okay? A time step size, okay? So the idea is to solve for V here and then there's this discretization. It's a function of both space and time. So that's why you see V, X, I, T, J here. And then the idea is to replace these partial derivatives by their uh, finite difference counterparts. This is from chapter five. And the result from 11.1.7 after doing that is, or this R result is what you see in 11.1.9, okay? Now I said, a result because the one thing that you should notice is that the there are many versions of a finite difference. And here, the choice for the left-hand side is a forward difference, but the choice for the right-hand side, okay? So here you see V sub S. So this is the derivative of V with respect to capital S. That's the space part, no? Um, you would notice that it's I plus one and I minus one. So this is a centered uh, difference. And you would also see it for the second derivative. And this is the centered second second derivative uh, finite difference formula. So the left-hand side is using um, a forward difference while the right-hand side are you're using a centered difference. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Okay, so that's what I mentioned here in as, a, as one of the points. Observe the replacement of the derivative by finite differences and that the left-hand side and the right-hand side are using different kinds of finite differences. Uh, I didn't have the, the time, or at least I didn't, um, I wasn't able to really write out a convincing argument for this part as to why it would be done this way, but it turns out that if you use a different kind of difference, finite difference, then you need you might have to use matrix algebra. And I think what, what they mean by this is that you might have to invert a matrix. Okay. So as to the details as to why it would look like that, that means that you have to write down the you know the system of equations, which I've done, but I have to, I didn't have a lot of time to put it up uh there. And I I, I'm still struggling with an explanation for it, but essentially this is what this leading question is uh, is all about, okay? So that's the, that's essentially the idea. Discretize over space and time, okay? And once you discretize over space and time, okay? And taking into account all of the other boundary conditions and in, initial conditions, again, these parts are, the, are relatively distracting uh, when you look at 11.1 .1 to 11.3, but essentially when you, you when you do that, when you do this discretization, you'll find that you'll have a nice solution, okay? And you'll have an animation to that effect, no? So you have this kind of solution, quite neat, okay? But as they, they say in the book, trouble lurks just around the corner. So what happened was that the simulation time was extended to t is equal to eight. So before it was t equals uh, six, but this time it's uh, t equals eight. That's the difference this time. And the animation here suggests there, that kind of instability, okay? So 
so essentially that's the there's this instability that we have to be aware of when you do this uh discretization over space and time okay that's there there's really not nothing much there aside from the fact that this natural application of chapter six is the source of the problem okay and that extension is the, is the problem although we would still be the solution would still use chapter six but in a different way and in terms of what's new in julia the answer is not much is new in the sense that if you look at the code i think the code is roughly readable in the sense that you know what you kind of would know what this would mean given given some time not too much time but just enough time and uh, if you look at the expressions here they're not very very complicated the only thing that's really new is this cool animation okay so you have first this animation part which is is of interest which basically accumulates a lot of these plots together okay you can see that uh here okay so it's really animating it's like uh, what, what they do with the cartoons of of your you know? so you have pieces of paper and then you flip through all those paper those pieces of paper so it's kind of kind of looks like that um and the other thing that is new is this reshape uh command here which it's only used for i think for the aesthetic the labeling i'm not sure why but the labeling has to be transposed or something like that. So you have t equals zero up to t equals eight. These are strings. And then it's gonna be transposed uh, in this form. That's the only thing that's uh, really new in terms of the Julia part. Everything else is probably very, very similar as before. Okay. Now, um, in terms of how to deal with the instability, the solution is actually simple. Don't simultaneously discretize. What you do is you separate discretizations instead. Okay. So the book refers to the fact that this is this separation of the discretization reflects the way a diffusion equation will be solved by hand in practice. But again, I didn't venture into that. But this is something of note. Okay, so the idea is to discretize over space. That's it. And the idea is that, okay, now I have, uh, I now have a vector this time, okay? I now have a vector this time for the U, okay? And you collect all of them. Let me just see the notation, sorry. Um, uh just a moment yes i think that's the one yeah so you do the discretization over uh over space okay and then once you do that okay once you do that you the the functions here u sub zero u sub one and so on are still continuous functions of t okay and what's going to happen is that this derivative, partial derivative of u with respect to t, okay, is now uh, in this form, okay, in this form. As an ordinary derivative, okay, you've already discretized over space. And then for u sub xx, this time you're also going to be exploiting the fact that you discretize over space. So the, the, finite differencing that you're going to be doing is over space. And the version of the par second order partial derivative is this D sub XX uh, matrix that we've seen before in chapter 10. Okay. And as a result, you would see that this is a system of linear ordinary differential equations. Okay. Um, you would notice that you have the derivative of some uh the derivative of u and then here it's a function of u okay and this d sub xx is really a constant matrix so that's the constant coefficient so that's why it's called the linear constant coefficient system of ordinary differential equations and this d sub xx were these are the differentiation matrices inspired by those finite difference formulas and um the version that you see in the book 
is not exactly the one that you see in 10.3, but it's roughly similar. It's only adapted to the special case of periodic end conditions. So that's what they did in 11.2. So they're trying to they're trying to lead you to the fact that it's not the initial conditions or the boundary conditions that are the problems, but rather the way you discretize that is the source of the problem. So they decided to turn off these boundary and initial condition stuff and decided to deal with periodic uh, periodic conditions instead. Okay. And again, uh, as I mentioned, the notation could be a bit unnerving. H is not a time step, unlike what you see in chapter six, but it's rather the space step, if you, if you wish. Okay. And then once you have this kind of vector of uh, ODEs, okay, a system of ODEs, you just apply chapter six directly. Okay. Okay. But again, there's this trouble lurks just around the corner because there's still a missing concept uh, and there's still some sort of instability that we have to document this, that we still have to document, okay? So they're, they're able to control for the fact that it's not the initial or the boundary conditions that are causing the problem. Uh, the discretization over, over space alone uh, helps, but there's still one thing that uh, that is missing. So, how do we actually apply uh, chapter C, chapter six to the semi-discretized uh, partial differential equation? Um, the idea is to again map everything that you've seen in chapter six into chapter eleven, taking into account that instead of looking at scalar ODEs, you're looking at vector ODEs, that's one. The second is that the time steps are in tau rather than in H, okay? Because we're now looking at uh, uh, the time step discretization. So you've already done the space dis discretization, you're now gonna do the time discretization, okay? So an example is this, uh, I'm gonna show you three examples. The first example is this Euler initial value problem integrator. The iterations, no, the the solution. One way to generate a solution, a numerical solution, is to march forward in time. That's the idea there, and the um, the iteration is given by this ex expression that you see here. This is from chapter six, and what you're going to do is just map it to chapter ten. So instead of the U I, so they change the notation. Oh, this should be J. Okay. So instead of uh, I, it's now labeled as J, but they're they're really just the index for the um, for the time steps, okay. And then the other thing is that instead of the scalar, you now have a vector, okay. And then the H instead of H, which is the time step before in chapter six, is, is now tau. And then this F T I U I is really the this expression here. Okay. Okay. So, so that becomes DXX U sub J. And then you could factor out the U sub J, and then you have this expression that you see here. Okay. And this I here should really be a J. Okay. So this is the version of the iteration uh, or finding of a solution. Uh, for a partial differential, for, for a diffusion equation using Euler's uh, method. But this is unstable, and you could see that from 11.2.3. And let me just point that out. Yeah. There's an, an, an animation that you, that you would see here. Okay. Yep. There's that instability. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the first example. The second example is a backward Euler or a one-step Adams Moulton uh, IVP in, in, integrator uh, or called AM1. The iteration is given by this expression that you see here with the convention that this F sub I plus one is really the F T sub I plus one comma U I plus one. That's the convention uh, from chapter six. Now mapping it to chapter 10, 
Again, the indices are now in terms of J and then the U instead of a scalar, you have a vector. The time step is tau instead of H. And then this F sub I plus one, again, uses DXX U sub J, but because it's I plus one, one, one time step further. So that's why it's uh, J plus one. And then if you, if you rewrite this, you would notice that you would have this, uh, uh, this form for the iterations. Okay. So you need to invert, invert a matrix. Okay. The DXX matrix is actually a sparse matrix. Okay. And this whole thing is also quite a sparse matrix, but the inversion is fast and the stable algorithms are, are possible are available. Okay. And from the demo, from the next demo, you would find that uh, this is actually quite stable relative to the Euler's to Euler's method. And AM1 or back and or backward Euler is one of those implicit uh, implicit methods. Okay. At this time it's an implicit time, it's an implicit time stepping methods. Okay. And they are more stable. And this is what you see in chapter six as well. Okay. Now there's an exercise uh, from 11.2 where you're asked to actually write down and code the uh, AM2, okay? So if you want to code that AM2, let me, let me show you that exercise. Yeah, so this AM2 shows up here in problems three and four, okay? You're asked to derive this AM2 and this iteration that you see here is based on a table from chapter six. So all of these iterate iterations here are based on chapter six uh, tables, okay? the tables for chapter six. And in one of the tables, you could write down the AM2 uh, iterations. And then it's just a matter of going through that mapping once again. And the, the difference this time is that AM2 is really a combination of the Euler and the backward Euler. And it's called the uh, Crank uh, Nicholson method. Okay. But if you do the coding, the only thing that is new really is uh, you're combining the code for Euler and for backward Euler. So, just as an example, I didn't do, did I do it here? Let me see. Yes, it's here. So, so this this line is the is the the key line for the iteration, and um, we have to invert one of the matrices, which is the one in the left hand side, okay. And then you have the matrix A that you multiply to U, okay. So that's what you see here, and then you have to invert this one. So you have this LU stuff from before. You use that for that part, and it's a direct extension of the code. Uh, the code that you see okay, I think here, yeah. So this is the Euler version. So if you want the backward Euler, there's a matrix here in front. So you have to invert, okay? So there's this LU stuff that you have to do. You could see that here. So you just combine the code together and then you get Crank Nicholson, okay? And uh, and then you could adapt the code in a in pretty much the same way. Create an a movie for the an animation for the for the stability part, and then you're done. And then you're done with that. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So this derivation, okay, is also useful because you'll be asked to to look at the stability of this AM2 in 11.3, okay. There. So that's uh, roughly the sort of like the main idea for, main ideas for 11.1 and 11.2. So there's this instability uh, when you do the discretization simultaneously. So what you do instead is you do it step-by-step. Step, okay? You do it sequentially. And uh, when you do that, uh, Basically, what you do is you discretize over space first, okay? And then you'll have the resulting discretization 
is a vector of, it's a system of ODEs that are linear and have constant coefficients. And then you could directly apply things that you see in chapter six, but in vector form. And then uh, you see again, the fact that implicit methods are doing very, very well, just like what you see in chapter six, okay? So, so what is how so you've seen that even if we do the sequential discretization, applying chapter six might still result in instability, kind of like what you see for the Euler integrator, but it doesn't happen for AM1, it also doesn't happen for AM2. So the question is why? And that's 11.3, okay? So the notation again is unnerving. Uh, tau is the step size again, the time step size. In chapter six, it's called the truncation error. So it could be annoying, but uh, yeah, that's just how it is. Um, and one thing, because you're use, you're, you've cast the problem in terms of uh, linear ODE, linear constant coefficient ODEs from chapter six, you'll find that all of these time-stepping methods are actually zero stable, uh, which is defined in section 6.8 of the book. Um, as the time, as the step size becomes very small, becomes very small. But the problem is that, the problem is that uh, in what you're doing in chapter 10, uh, in chapter 11, uh, the step size actually stays fixed while the number of nodes go to infinity. So that's the, the, the asymptotic, sort of like the asymptotic theory is done in a different way. So the asymptotic theory, quote unquote, for chapter six is step size goes to zero, but in chapter 10, uh, somehow the asymptotics that are involved is that the tau time step size stays fixed while the number of nodes for the yeah for the time discretization goes to infinity okay so that's the that's the idea for for this part and the uh, what you want is to choose this time step size in a very particular way okay and you don't want to be arbitrary with respect to this tau uh so the theory suggests that smaller tau is good but how small so you so you need to get a sense of uh how the magnitude of this tau uh affects a numerical solution and basically you don't want this explosive growth showing up kind of like what you see in the animation so you want to control the size of those solutions so you want boundedness as n goes to infinity and that's what you see here for the definition for absolute stability. So you have a numerical solution at every point in time when you do the iterations and you have a fixed step size. And what you want to do is as you do the iterations, you don't want the numerical solution to explode. And the idea is to make sure that you have some form of absolute stability, which what that means is that you want YN bar uh, sorry, you want the absolute value of yn to be bounded above as n goes to infinity as you let this uh, iteration run indefinitely. And you would notice that there's a new symbol. Uh, there was there's a new there are a couple of new symbols showing up in the definition of absolute stability, and it's the lam it's lambda and this she. Okay, so the tau is the step size, of the time dimension, the lambda. Where is it coming from? So the idea is that this system of differential equations that you see here could, because this d sub x, x is not necessarily diagonal, it's possible to rewrite this, rewrite this system of equations in such a way that the constant coefficient here becomes diagonal. Because if you have a diagonal matrix for d sub x, x, or whatever matrix will show up here, as long as it's constant, constant set of coefficients, you'll be able to analyze each differential equation separately. Okay, that's the idea. 
And you see that here on top. So you classic eigenvalue decomposition so that you'll be able to have a matrix here, D that is diagonal. And then you could have this kind of decoupling. Decoupling means that you, you could analyze each of these, each of the elements of the vector in Y separately as if you're looking at the scalar differential equation, okay? And, and the only way to have this, uh, and then this, each of these differential equations, scale, each, each of these separate differential equations will have a constant coefficient in front of Y and this constant coefficient coincides with the eigenvalue, uh, the eigenvalues you found from the eigenvalue decomposition, uh, eigen decomposition uh, for, for the D sub X, X, okay? And you can now analyze stability here. You want boundedness, absolute stability. So if you want boundedness, you want to make sure that the real component of this lambda is less than or equal to zero, okay? If it's greater than zero, then the solution will explode. That's essentially the idea. Um, yeah. So that's where the lambda is coming from. And then what's not very obvious is why it's tau times lambda, okay? That's not, the very, that's not very obvious. So where is it coming from? Yeah, so I, that's the part that is done already. So I, I, I'm gonna use the, the book instead. So where is this tau times lambda coming from? The idea is best seen in example 11.3.4, where you have the Euler's version of uh, y prime equals lambda times y, okay? So here, go. you, you could do the discretization here, kind of similar to what I've done, uh, for example, one here in the in the notes, okay? But this time for a scalar, okay? So basically you, you use this iteration, give, you, you use this uh, equation that you see here, u sub i plus one equals u sub i plus h, f of ti ui. But this time, instead of u, it's y, okay? And then instead of h, it's tau. That's the that's the only change this time, okay? And then here, you'll quickly see that there's a tau times lambda showing up, okay? Tau times lambda showing up. And in fact, in, in this class of equations and in the discretizations that you're gonna be doing, tau times lambda shows up prominently, okay? So it's not just the step size that plays a role in absolute stability, okay? But the eigenvalues, uh, they also play a role, okay? That's the, and it's their product that plays a role, okay? So that's the, that's the key thing, okay? So essentially what this tells you is that there are restrictions on, on this tau times lambda uh, that you have to sort of like respect so that you would get meaningful results from the from the integrator that you're using, okay? So here you see that uh, there are restrictions with respect to the si the magnitude of uh, the values of this uh, she, okay? Yeah, what's interesting to me is that it's, it's kind of a surprise. Right? It's clear that eigenvalue is positive. That's a problem. <laughs> it's going to explode. What's weird is it's negative and like two negative, for example. That's a problem too. It's like yeah. if because uh, if the step size is not small enough, I guess in some is the yeah. way you say it. But you can make it fine by making the step size smaller and smaller. But it's kind of a dynamic constraint on the step size beyond just accuracy constraints. How I read it, but it's just interesting that, that happens. Yeah. So that that's the sort of like the this is the most probably the most interesting thing about the about this chapter is this interplay between these. You just you 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 the eigenvalues are just one thing, okay. You also have this uh, step size that you have to sort of like control in some sense. Yeah, yeah. So and it's and you could go through all of those methods that you've seen before, uh, in chapter six, and you'll see that she tau times lambda shows up every time, okay? at least for this class of uh, uh, equations. 
Okay. And of course, the only thing that is preventing us from doing a very complete theoretical analysis is that sometimes the the region of stability is complicated that like what you see in 11.3.6 okay so take note that if she were real were real then this is not so bad but the problem is that she is allowed to be complex so you're looking at the com at the complex plane this time right because the complex eigenvalues correspond to oscillatory solutions right to that's the right original equation exactly so depending on the sort of like the subject ma subject matter domain, these oscillating solutions might not be of interest, but uh, this the treatment allows for those oscillating uh, solutions. And that's what complicates the study of this uh, of these kinds of inequalities. But for real, if she were real, then this should be a little bit more straightforward. And the key figures in 11.3 are really figure 11.3.1 and 11.3.2, which basically illustrate the stability regions uh, for the different methods that are available for solving differential equations numerically. And you would notice that uh, AM, AM2 covers the entire complex plane. So the uh, horizontal axis here is the real component of Xi and then the vertical axis here is the uh, is the imaginary component of she. Okay, and then two, three, four, and five are the how many steps you're gonna do the the multi-step method. Okay, and uh, you would also notice that it seems that you you don't want to have too many steps. It seems at least that's what I could uh, that's what I could see from these figures. Okay, you don't have to have too many. You know, you you could use a multi-step method, but not. Uh, but that multiple steps shouldn't be too much. I think, at, at least that's what you could see from this. Uh, from these figures. Okay. Yeah. So. So what ha what happens is that uh, these create constraints as to what step sizes should you you should be focusing on. So in so in that sense, this is more practical. This is a little bit, this is quite practical. But the problem is that the problem is that you need, I think you at some level to use it in practice, you need to know what lambda is. Okay. So that you know uh what step size to use because it's tau times lambda, right? So um, that's the I think that's the limiting limiting constraining part of this uh analysis okay and let me see yeah yeah and then the rem the remaining the remainder of the section is to just go back to the heat equation that's it in terms of the new thing here the new thing is probably the scatter plot involving uh involving the complex plane uh but Aside from that, things are roughly similar as before, okay? Yeah. And then there are sort of like, so if, if you notice one of the analysis for the, for the chapter is really this uh, heat equation here. And you would notice that there's a restriction in the time step, okay? It's not a, it's not all time steps that are valid, but tau that are greater than or equal to one over two m square, where m is the number of nodes that you use for the, sp for the space discretization. Okay, at least that's what you, what you see from this, uh, from this example, and the exercises that you see here, basically go through those, uh, those concerns. Like for example. The first one is this these are oscillating solutions and then and then you could find the eigenvalues are imaginary and then you could determine uh whether the solutions are bounded you could use the figures to do the what if there are time step restrictions that you need depending on the ivp methods that you use okay and then problems five and six are also very interesting in the sense that you could ask the question which of the methods that you've seen in chapter six are useful for problems that have eigenvalues on the imaginary axis. So again, <clears throat> again, I think 
subject matter knowledge is needed to determine whether or not you would expect uh, eigenvalues to have imaginary parts. And that's where this analysis here will be useful uh, with regard to the time, the choice of the time step. And then, yeah, the last. Uh, so problem, what is the answer to that one? AM2, right, I presume? Yeah, AM2 is doing very, AM2 is doing very well there. AM2 is very doing very well, but if you do AM3, there's a risk. It's only stable within this region here. That does make sense because we've done in the past um, differential equations. They're essentially like sines and cosines, like they tend to blow up or shrink down or whatever. If uh, unless you have uh, unless you use an implicit method like that, yeah. And even implicit methods actually have restrictions, so they don't work everywhere, especially if you carry out the multiple steps. Uh, yeah, but for a long time, the two-step one, right? Yeah, the two-step one is doing doing just fine. And here for the backward uh, different uh, backward versions. Oh yeah, that would work too. It's the exterior one. So here you have to look at the exterior parts. Those are the stability regions, okay? As opposed to the interior ones. So yeah, that's uh, what you see from from this from this part. I guess it's not intuitive that like higher order is bad. Maybe can be bad. I guess in some situations. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, I think the the ultimate thing that you see is that you would tend to prefer methods with no time step restrictions uh, at the end of the day, and and uh, and that uh, absolute stability, the notion of absolute stability, uh, plays a role in this uh, in this discussion, and the choice of tau. Uh, is influenced by it, and lambda. They they are sort of like very 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 linked uh, together, and it's something to pay attention to when you want to solve uh, uh, these kinds of uh, diffusion equations. And I think that's what I have uh, for the moment. There's not a lot of coding per se. Um, the coding is really take off from modific small, relatively small modifications. There are some things that I did where, I think in 11.2, there's a problem where you're asked to guess sort of like what's the smallest, smallest number of nodes in the time space, in the time, sorry, in the time discretization uh, before things start to explode or something like that, something like that. So there's that kind of, uh, this is probably the more challenging thing to code in a nice way, but in a rough way, this is relatively straightforward. The rest are similar in, in, similar in spirit uh, as before. But I think in terms of new things in Julia, really not, not much except for that animate thing, which is uh, the, cool, the cool one. <laughs> I think that's about it for, for me today. Uh, next week, I'll do 11.4 and 11.5. Yeah. Yeah, great. Thanks so much. Uh, reasonable. <laughs> Hopefully, it's reasonable. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, let me, let me put the uh, stop here.